Welcome to our Hearst Cycles webinar for the 18th of September 2017. I'm delighted to be back and I'm delighted to welcome all of you back. We have a huge number of people uh, attending live and um, we have an even greater number of people who registered who will uh, no doubt be catching up with the recording. So thank you so much uh, for your interest in Hearst Cycles. Thank you for joining me. Uh, as always, I must ask you to please make sure that you have read and understood these disclaimers. Now, I thought that because today is the first webinar of a new season, as it were, I would take a bit of a step back and we would take a look at some stock markets from around the world. And uh, we're going to focus primarily on the S&P 500. And I'm going to take a look at what the S&P 500 is doing at the moment. I'm going to look at some other markets, the Canadian TSX. Um, if there's time, I'll take a quick look at the Australian ASX. And we might even glance at the South African market. I know not many of you trade the South African market, but um, it's very useful to provide additional information about what might be happening in markets around the world if you take a look at a group of them. So let's switch straight over to Sentient Trader and uh, let me just turn off that composite line uh, before it gets too distracting and uh, this webinar system seems to want to prevent me from actually uh, clicking buttons in any other program. Ah, there we go. Okay, so we've managed to do that. And let's open a pen so that I can do a little bit of drawing. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at some at some stock markets, primarily the S&P 500, and I'm going to ask and hopefully answer some questions about what I think is happening in these markets. And in the process, I hope that I am also going to illustrate to you how I approach Hearst Cycles. My approach to Hearst Cycles is not necessarily uh, the best approach, but it's an approach that has worked for me for many years. And um, and I'm going to show you how I work with Sentient Trader and how I get the most out of Sentient Trader. So I do hope that you find that interesting. If you have any questions at any time uh, during the course of the webinar, please do ask them. I'm not going to keep my eyes glued to the chat window because I find if I do that, I find it uh, difficult to string together an intelligible sentence. So please don't be offended if uh, it takes me a little while to respond to your question that you ask in the chat window, but I will every now and then go back to the chat window and just make sure that I'm keeping up with what everybody is saying. I'm trying to start a pen here so that I can scribble on my charts, which is something that I love doing. Uh, but let's uh, in the meantime uh, get started over here. Okay, uh, I see Paolo has audio. KO, is that knockout? Does that mean no good? Not working? Has the audio dropped out? Um, I wonder if it's possible uh, for me to have even further problems with this computer today. Here we go. I've managed to get a pen going. That's at least that's at least a good start. It's back. Okay, so I uh, I do apologize for the fact that the audio is cutting out. Um, as Tsaba, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, says it's a bandwidth thing. Um, I, I, I apologize for that. If audio drops out, just ask me to repeat myself. That's unfortunately at the moment all that I can do. So let's take a look at uh, the S&P 500. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, zoom all the way out and I'm, I'm just going to start speaking about it. If you have any questions, then uh, be sure to put them into the chat window. Okay, so here is the S&P 500. Now, this is some data that I loaded from a computer at home. Um, and in fact, it's MetaTrader 4 data. Uh, you can you can get data from all kinds of different sources and I know some people are very precious about data and the the exactness of the data and most data uh, running through MetaTrader 4 is not very exact it's not very perfect but in terms of of performing a general analysis to try and understand uh, what is going on in the market uh, I think this data is is perfectly reasonable uh, you can see this data goes back to 1998, early 1998, and um, you might ask why didn't I make sure that I'd loaded data back to, to before 1997? Um, uh, you know, because the, the, there was a trough then, or before 1993, when there was a when there was a trough in this market, and um, it's a question that we get often: how much data should you load? And I know it often shocks people, but 
I don't worry too much about the amount of data that I load. I like to make sure that I've loaded 15 to 20 years, ideally 20 years worth of data, and this is, this is about 19 years worth of data. The reason why I like to load that much data is because then I have two nine-year cycles to look at, roughly speaking. Um, of course, ideally, you would go back a little bit, a little bit further on this data to catch the uh, trough that price is rising out of over here. But uh, you know, when I'm performing a Hearst cycles analysis, I'm focusing on the cycles that I'm interested in, and those are the cycles for end of day trading. I'm not speaking about intraday trading here. Those are the cycles from 20 days up to 18 months. So. Uh, I'm not terribly worried about loading a, a huge amount of data and going going back further and further and further in order to uh, make sure that I'm catching all of those troughs and correctly identifying the nine-year cycle troughs. And I think as we work through a, a study of this workspace, you will see you'll see how that works and why you don't need to worry too much about data. Um, in my opinion. Of course, everybody has a different approach and some people use, uh, use a huge amount of data and they want to uh, refine their analyses and make sure that they're absolutely perfect. It's a different way of doing things and um, I respect that. So the first thing that I did with this workspace was I clicked on the green Analyze Now button. I know that you should uh, probably spend some time thinking about the analysis period. In other words, what amount of data or what period of data you're actually analyzing. But uh, you, you know, after many years of working with Sentient Trader, I just hit that green button. It's pretty much the first thing I do, and I see what Sentient Trader does. And I uh, observe, uh, you know, what has happened. Let me see if I can now turn this pen on. That would be really nice. Uh, and so, having performed the analysis, Sentient Trader, uh, as you can see, has positioned a nine-year cycle trough over here in uh, 2002. Uh, it's positioned a 54-month cycle trough here in 2009, and it's positioned another nine-year cycle trough here in 2012. Now, if you've watched previous webinars that uh, that I've done, you will know that that is a possible, a slightly unusual, but it is a possible analysis. Uh, in my opinion, uh, it's not necessarily the best analysis, but it's a very viable analysis. In terms of what's been happening recently, you can see that there is a 54-month cycle trough over here in 2016. Now, uh, in 2016, at around about that time, um, uh, uh, we were doing webinars and I was talking about the trough that had just formed in the markets. And at the time, I mentioned that I thought that was probably a trough of at least 18-month magnitude, maybe even 54-month magnitude. Because this is the approach that I think one needs to take with her cycles, is you work out your level of confidence in any trough. My level of confidence at the time in that trough was 18 months. I was pretty confident it was an 18-month trough. Uh, possibly, I thought it might have been a 54-month cycle trough. So, having a look at this default analysis that I've performed, I haven't done any tweaks to the software or anything. This default analysis is a fairly reasonable analysis. Um, so, uh, let's just clear those marks. So, I'm, I'm happy to, to start working with this analysis, if you like, in terms of there being uh, only a trough analysis on the chart. So, uh, what is happening in terms of this analysis? Well, we had a 54-month cycle uh, trough over there, and price had bounced out of out of a really, really big trough over there in 2009, which surreptitiously in the back of my mind, I have always wondered whether that might be a really big trough. Is that a nine-year trough? Is it even an 18-year trough or even a bigger cycle trough? It's a pretty big trough. So uh, what happens when price bounces out of a 54-month cycle trough? Well, initially, I, whenever price bounces out of a trough, I expect to see something that looks fairly symmetrical in terms of price action. Price rises up to a peak, comes down to the trough, then I expect to see a symmetrical bounce out, and the symmetrical price action should continue. At some point, symmetrical price action always breaks down, and the reason that it breaks down is because of um, the longer cycles and the cycles that we cannot see on this chart which are influencing the analysis.
So I've drawn a, a sort of an, an M shape there, and, uh, and I can see you're all saying, well, that M shape didn't work out, did it? Okay, because it came up, came down to a trough, came back up again. Okay, and then a symmetrical price action would have given me that, that kind of action, a downwards action over there. So let's zoom in and see what happened and see how uh, one handles that kind of situation as a Hearst Cycles Analyst. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in just on that period of data over there. So here again is our 54-month cycle trough. Okay, and if I had been expecting, as I, as I was, if I was expecting a symmetrical price action, I would have expected price to go up and then come down, okay, in forming a perfect M shape, and I would have been expecting it to do that, okay, assuming that there are no longer cycles that are influencing this price movement and uh, uh, causing it to continue its bullish move. Okay, so as you can see, if I zoom in yet again, uh, initially, and uh, let me just take it up to there, let me just zoom into there. Initially, uh, price did start doing what looked as if it might have been a fairly symmetrical bounce out of that trough. Okay, and in fact, I wrote some blog posts, and we even did, uh, I think I even discussed it in a webinar. I discussed the symmetrical price action in this period from here, okay, to the trough, and then the symmetrical price action up to there. All right, we even had, um, uh, there, there are lots of uh, little details about that price action, which show it to be very symmetrical. In fact, let me just zoom in on that so that we can, so that we can really see that. And um, so if you, if you look at those, those, uh, th that period there, you can see quite a lot of symmetrical price action. You know, we had a, we had a peak here, one, two, three peaks, and one, two, three peaks, okay? Um, uh, we, we had a pretty steep move down, pretty steep move up, okay? So we had a symmetrical price action for a while, which is what you always expect around any trough. doesn't matter what magnitude um, it is, you're going to expect some symmetrical price action for some time. Uh, the important thing, of course, is that eventually that asymmetrical price action breaks down and things stop being symmetrical. And so, uh, let me zoom out again, there we go. And the point at which that price action stopped being symmetrical was at this point over here, when price suddenly, in uh, the end of June last year, suddenly jumped upwards and it formed yet another peak. So now, all of a sudden, our price action around this trough here was not symmetrical, and we had a a, a break in the in the symmetry. So at around this point, um, we started asking, or I started asking myself, what's happening in terms of these peaks? And let me explain why. Let me go back again, and um, so here we go. In 2015. I was writing blog posts about the fact that I expected a nine-year cycle peak to come in, to form, okay? And a, a very sort of rounded peak did form at around about that time. Remember that peaks in stock markets are almost always rounded, whereas troughs are very sharp, sharp and isolated. It's because the troughs are synchronized, whereas the peaks are not necessarily. So I was looking for a nine-year cycle peak. Um, and I, in fact, I'll write this here because I was waiting for that peak to happen. We had a peak over here, we had a peak over here, and I was looking for another peak to form uh, at around about that time in 2015. Uh, when price in June of last year started jumping up again, okay, I asked myself, has that nine-year peak formed or is it still coming? I, I, you know, do we do we still expect it? So if I'm if I sort of zoom in on that period of time there, you know, here is the rounded peak that formed in uh, about the middle of July uh, of 2015, and price came down, formed a trough, and then bounced up again. 
So it's time now to apply a peak analysis onto this chart. So we display a peak analysis and let me just zoom all the way out again. And let's see what this peak analysis is telling us. This is again just the default nominal model. It's a default analysis. I haven't done anything to it. So the peak analysis obviously has found a nine year peak over there. It's found a nine year peak over there and it's found a very poorly phased nine year peak over there. I hope that you can see that because this is a really important point. The software is doing its best to, to try to perform an analysis using the information that it has. And, and when it does things wrong, you, as the uh, terribly clever human, have to step in and say, whoa, there's something wrong there. Okay, so if we zoom in and, and have a look at that analysis, you can see that uh, Sentin Trader has positioned this nine year peak on that tiny little ineffectual little peak there. Okay, that's really bad analysis. There's no other way of putting it. Okay, it's very bad analysis. And so Sentient Trader needs some help. There's a, there's a fairly good prominent peak over there and Sentient Trader has put an 18 month cycle over there and then a nine year peak over here. So there's something wrong. Okay, well, what's wrong? What we do then, or what I do, is I zoom out and I and I look at the whole chart and I and I start measuring things. Measuring is really important when it comes to Hearst cycles. So I start measuring things and I measure from this peak over here, press the control button and I measure that peak that's that's seven and a half years, two thousand seven hundred and fifty three days uh, between those peaks. So I've given Sentient Trader a nominal model which is a list of cycles which includes a nine year cycle. In fact there were seven and a half years in there. So that's not that's not too short uh, for a nine year cycle, but let's just measure again up to the next one. So I measure up to this one and you uh, to that peak that uh, that I suspect might be peak of the nine year cycle. And I see that 7.67 years or 2800 days. OK, so it's only just a little bit longer than the first one. Uh, the first peak to peak distance. Okay, that's 2,762, that's 2,783. There are only 20 days difference in the length between those cycles. And let me turn the pen on and just, just emphasize that. Between this peak here and this peak and this that peak and this peak over here the 2015 possible peak, there was only a 20 day difference. Now when I see something like that, it, it, it really jumps out at me because you've got two very nearly equal cycle lengths, wavelengths there. I start getting a little bit excited about it and I start saying, okay, I think that was almost certainly the nine year cycle peak. Okay, and then if that was the nine year cycle peak, well, let me not get ahead of myself. Let's start exploring that idea. So then what I do is I leave this chart because I think it's very important to keep a chart with a normal analysis so you can go back and do what I'm doing in today's webinar. You can go back and you can look at it and you can you can ask yourself, you know, um, uh, uh, what is the my train of thought in terms of these analyses? I then created a uh, another um, another chart and let me just zoom out here and uh, what I did was I performed exactly the same analysis on the troughs. You can see exactly the same analysis on the troughs. But uh, what I did with the peaks is I told Sentient Trader, look, I think there might be a seven and a half year cycle here. And the way I did that, I'm not going to spend time in today's webinar um, going into the detail, but the way I did that is I created a nominal model for the peaks. And in that nominal model, I told Sentient Trader, I think it's not a nine year cycle you're looking for. I think it's a seven and a half year cycle. So try and look for a seven and a half year cycle. And uh, so indeed, uh, Sentient Trader looked for a seven and a half year cycle instead of a nine year cycle in the peaks, in the peaks only. And you can see that it found a seven and a half year cycle peak there, there, and there. Okay, so now in my opinion, this analysis is looking better, and I hope you can see why. The reason why is because all the really quite prominent peaks on this chart 
have have markers for 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 uh, you know prominent peaks in the analysis so that's an indication that this is in my opinion a better analysis than the previous one all right now you might be saying saying to yourself at the moment but how can this possibly be a if I can turn that pin on how can this possibly be a nine year peak over here if only one year later price is shooting upwards most people when they first approach Hearst cycles in financial markets assume that because I say that's a nine year peak they assume that that means that the market's going to be falling for four and a half years and then it's going to rise for another four and a half years and form another nine year peak. Okay, it's the biggest misunderstanding um, when people first approach Hearst cycles. And it is also uh, possibly the reason why many people who get excited about Hearst cycles end up dropping them because they think, oh no, this just isn't working. Because the analysis is telling you a, a nine year cycle peak has come in, but only a year later, uh, price is at a higher level. That means surely that is an invalid nine-year cycle peak. Well, it doesn't, and that's the really, really important uh, uh, thing to understand. What tends to happen is that the market bounces from a nine-year cycle peak uh, down to a nine-year cycle trough. There's the nine-year cycle trough. And then it'll, um, well, let's, let's go back in time. Uh, sorry, I should do this back in time. It goes from a nine-year cycle peak down to a nine year cycle trough okay then it goes nine year cycle peak and it goes down to a nine year cycle trough ah now there's an interesting question because here's our nine year cycle trough and the software has put a 54 month cycle trough over there okay so something um, slightly odd is happening around about this time okay so let's uh, uh, find another way of looking at that um, I hope that if you're working with Sentient Trader software, you've discovered the zigzags. Now, the zigzags are not the normal zigzags that people speak about in financial markets. There is a zigzag indicator that you get. Zigzags are very specifically uh, my interpretation of how cycles influence financial markets because of the cycles that are um, active in them. And um, so if we display the zigzags, and I can do that by clicking on zigzag over here, then um, what will happen is, oh, I don't have any selected, there we go, and let me turn that on again, perhaps I haven't calculated them. Uh, what happens is when you display these zigzags, oh, let me just turn those on, there we go, uh, you can plot statistics at the top right of the chart. And those statistics are, 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 are very useful and interesting pieces of information. Um, so here you can see I've got the nine year zigzag, the 54 month zigzag, and the 18 month zigzag all displayed. Let's turn off the shorter ones and just for now focus on the nine year zigzag. So what happens with the nine year zigzag is it gives us lines uh, that are probably too faint on this chart for you to see clearly, but it gives us lines from the nine year peaks down to the nine year troughs, back up to the nine year peaks, down to the nine year troughs, oops, that's over here, and then up to the nine year uh, peak. And, and then it gives us a projection for the next move. Now, when it colors that projection in the color of the cycle, which for the nine-year cycle, unfortunately, is also a kind of a reddish color, um, so it might not be making sense to you right now, but just uh, give me a moment, I'll explain. Uh, when it gives you the projection, it gives you the projection in the color of the cycle, okay? And um, so let me turn off the nine-year and give you the 54-month. Um, if, however, it gives you a projection which is um, red in color, and I've zoomed in. If it gives you a projection which is red in color, then it means that's an invalid projection. Here's the projection for the 54-month cycle, which, uh, as I think you can see, is projecting from this 54-month cycle trough up to this expected 54-month cycle peak, and it is orange, which is the color of the 54-month cycle. Okay. Now, when I uh, turn that zigzag off and turn on the nine-year 
zigzag, you will see that the current projection for the nine-year cycle is red in color, and it's this projection over here. If it's red in color, that means it's an invalid projection. Okay, and an invalid projection is simply simply means that the next trough of the nine-year cycle is in fact um, uh, going to be higher than the previous peak of the nine-year cycle. So we have an anomaly there. Okay, um, and it's a it's a useful way of looking at your analyses and spotting anomalies in your analysis if you hadn't spotted uh, the anomaly yourself visually. So what is the anomaly here? Well, the anomaly here is that we have a nine-year trough, then a nine-year peak, then we have only a 54-month cycle trough, and then here we have a nine-year cycle trough over here, and here we have a nine-year cycle peak. Can you see it's slightly out of step with itself? And so from this nine-year cycle peak, we expect the market to move down to a 54-month cycle trough, as it did, then up to a 54-month cycle peak, and then it should drop down to a lower nine-year cycle trough. Okay, so that might be what is about to happen. It might be. But it doesn't really make sense to me, because what happens, and let me zoom in and uh, and explain it in in some detail here. What happens when you get a uh, price moving out of a nine-year peak and uh, moving then towards this nine-year cycle trough? What you ec normally expect to happen is you expect price to move down, as it did, to the lowest trough that it's going to encounter on the way. Then it moves up to the highest trough that it's going to encounter on the way, which is actually this 54-month cycle peak expected over here in 2019. And you expect then uh, this line that I will label 1, which is the line down, and this line, which is the line up, you expect them to be fairly balanced. And the resultant end move bisects this line number 2. Okay, so we're going to get a situation like that. I hope that you can see that it's not looking like a very balanced picture. So potentially there's something else wrong in our analysis. So what I do again is I leave this chart as it is and I create a new one. Okay, and I then ask myself whether it is possible that these shorter cycles are also beating with a faster rhythm. So they have, uh, I, I mean not the shorter cycles, I beg your pardon, whether the, the, the trough cycles are also beating with a faster rhythm. They have shorter wavelengths. So I applied the same nominal model, which has seven and a half years, to this um, chart over here, and I get this analysis. Now, I hope that you can see here with this analysis, we get a nine-year cycle trough, or it's about a seven-year cycle trough, over here in 2009. We had one here in 2002, and we had one here in 2016. So that trough in 2016 was not the 18-month cycle trough, not the 54-month cycle trough, but potentially the nine-year cycle trough, or in this case it's, it's running short, so it's a seven-year cycle trough. We have the same analysis in the peaks, with a seven-year peak there, a seven-year peak there, and a seven-year peak there. Now this analysis doesn't have any anomalies, which is why I like it so much. I much prefer an analysis when it doesn't present me with any anomalies once I've finished the analysis, and it looks like a, a, a very reasonable analysis. And again, we can use the zigzags to Let's calculate those zigzag lines. We can uh, use the zigzags to um, explore whether there are, there are any anomalies by having a look at the percentage moves that are valid. And uh, the higher percentage moves that are valid, the better the analysis is. So if I turn off the uh, 18 month and I turn off oh, uh, this mouse keeps sort of moving around I don't want to do any uh, I don't want to do any envelopes 
and there we go yeah, let's turn off those envelopes that was a mistake uh, this mouse has a, some kind of a lag on it okay there we go so now I've got my zigzags um, for the nine year cycle and if you have a look at that zigzag line you can see the zigzag moves from the peak to the trough to the peak to the trough to the peak to the trough and now it's moving up to the next peak so there are no anomalies here there are no um, uh, false zigzags or or anything going wrong I really like this analysis and for some time I've been following this analysis I think that this um, analysis gives us a very good idea of um, what is really happening in the market so to come back to the the initial problem that caused me to start exploring other analyses and that problem was just to remind you how come if there is a nine year or a seven year cycle peak over here in 2015 um, you know how come we're seeing higher prices so soon after that nine year cycle peak well the answer to that is because price moved from the nine year cycle peak down into the nine year cycle trough which was this move over here a perfect zigzag very nice uh, three-legged zigzag move down into the nine-year cycle trough in 2016 and the reason we're seeing higher prices is because in fact the nine-year cycle formed a trough at that time and prices are now moving upwards Okay, you might be a little surprised because for um, a very long time I've been uh, fairly bearish. I keep speaking about peaks and when are those peaks going to come in because I've been looking for um, these uh, uh, nine year cycle peaks. Uh, now I am uh, indeed distinctly uh, bullish these markets because I'm of the opinion that a nine year cycle trough formed in 2016. Okay. Um, I should say as a caveat that it is very important even when you have a good analysis and I believe this is a good analysis even when you have a good analysis it's very important to keep an eye on your other analyses uh, uh, which is why I keep all these other charts uh, present in the workspace I keep an eye on them because if the analysis that I've chosen is the correct one um, uh, it turns out to be wrong and it's always possible I've been wrong before and no doubt I will be wrong again if it turns out that this is the the incorrect analysis then it's going to be very useful to for us to have these analyses here um, uh, whereby we can question whether in fact the nine year cycle peak is still about to happen because as you can see in this analysis this analysis is indicating that the nine year cycle peak should be happening round about now and then we're looking for a move down so that is possible but it's unlikely in my opinion and certainly uh, any trading that I'm doing at the moment I'm uh, trading on the basis of of this particular analysis and then we can play around with some of the tools we can um, we can uh, you know display our composite line model and see what that composite line model uh, composite model line is telling us uh, to expect over over the, the next while um, uh, which is basically a bullish move up to this 18 month cycle peak that we are expecting uh, towards the end of this year an 18 month cycle peak then we might see a bit of downward movement a bit of flatlining maybe a final but very subdued push up to this 54 month cycle peak in early 2019 okay um, I see a question from David Preston hello David where does the 18 year and Sigma L come in all right so that's a great question and um, I was, I was going to sort of skip that um, but I, I think it's an, it's an important thing to uh, to speak about and in fact um, having uh, started speaking about the composite line let me uh, now speak about Sigma L so let me uh, zoom all the way out okay here is the data that we have now Sigma L for those of you who don't know what it means uh, uh, stands for the sum of all longer cycles so an infinite number of cycles influence financial markets and here we're looking at an, an analysis that spans from nine years at the longer end uh, all the way down to um, you know five days or something so the question is as David asks what about the 18 year cycle what's the 18 year cycle doing and Sigma L which is the sum of all the longer cycles 
um, perhaps there's a 36-year cycle, perhaps there's a 54-year contratif cycle, um, we don't know, or, or um, I, I don't know, um, but there are longer cycles that are influencing price movements. And uh, so as David points out, uh, what about those cycles? Well, looking at this chart at the moment, um, I'd be inclined to say that this trough in 2009 was maybe not the nine-year cycle, perhaps that was also the 18-year cycle. Um, but I have no evidence to support that. It's, it's pure speculation. So what do we do? Well, um, what we do with Sentient Trader is um, we get Sentient Trader to calculate the, uh, the Sigma L which is the sum of of all the longer cycles so let me show you this um, this feature here uh, this is a feature called cycle lines and it shows you um, the sort of pure cycle so this is I've selected the nine year cycle or in fact as I've already pointed out it's about seven years so the solid line here is the trough line and in fact what I can do is I can um, uh, no, what I can do is I can just show one of them. There we go. So that's the trough line. So the the, the trough analysis, that's the nine-year cycle. I'm doing that over there. And um, this here is, is both of them. So you have the trough line and the peak line. And there's a lot of very interesting um, uh, information to be gleaned from studying the cycle lines. Uh, there isn't time to discuss it in, in today's webinar, but what I will show you is uh, what Sentient Trader has calculated as Sigma L. So that blue line is what, sig is what Sentient Trader has calculated um, Sigma L consists of. So there are many things to say about this. Um, where do I start? Let me move that up a little bit and let me actually just sort of expand it a little bit. Um, oops, uh, too much. So uh, Sentient Trader calculates um, Sigma L by constructing an artificial price action on the basis of the analysis that it has. So in other words, it performs an analysis and then it calculates uh, um, a cyclic model. So it takes the cycle information from each of the cycles, from five days all the way up to nine years in this case, and it constructs an artificial um, uh, composite model, which shows you what that analysis uh, is telling you would have been happening in the price action. Then it compares that model to what did actually happen and it uh, calculates the difference and that difference it bundles into one thing which it calls Sigma L. Um, I, I, would, I, would actually, um, I would actually say that um, there are two elements of Sigma L. One is the sum of all the longer cycles and the other is is uh, what I call Sigma U, which is the, the sum of all unknown influences on the, f on the market that you're analyzing. Because not everything that causes financial markets to move is a cycle. Um, some things that cause financial markets to move are unknown. So um, the line that you're seeing here is the combination of all longer cycles and also the combination of, of unknown effects on the market. So um, it's all been sort of bundled down into into one thing, Sigma L. I should point out that Sigma L doesn't have a scale. Um, and and uh, it's, it's a rather complicated thing for me to explain. But um, uh, it doesn't have a scale. So, so you can you can uh, adjust the scale of Sigma L, um, you know, just by adjusting the, the scale of the cycle line. Um, so so what what is Sigma L telling us? Well, um, several uh, rather interesting things um, occur uh, when we study Sigma L and that is that you have some shorter term fluctuations. Can you see that? You have a bit of a trough there and a bit of a trough there and a bit of a trough there. Let's ignore the future for now because that's estimated so let's ignore that. Um, and you have a bit of a trough there and you've got a bit of a, a peak if I draw a triangle there and you've got a bit of a peak there. So why does Sigma L have um, peaks and troughs uh, of what are clearly sort of shorter fluctuations. 
Well, that's the unknown component. Um, the cyclic model that that we have used to perform that uh, that results from this analysis um, doesn't account for those slight wiggles in price um, that occurred around about those times. So that's the first thing to point out that there are some shorter term fluctuations which are caused by other things. What those other things are, I, I really couldn't tell you. It could be the strength of the American economy. It could be quantitative easing that maybe didn't happen perfectly according to a, a cycle schedule. Um, it could be uh, simply a change of uh, social mood, if you um, are interested in social mood and how it influences financial markets. Uh, so th that's the first thing to observe. The second thing to observe about this uh, sigma L is this very strong sort of sudden move upwards over here. Sigma L, if we draw a line through it, was going pretty sort of slowly up and then suddenly it accelerated upwards. So what is that sudden acceleration upwards? Uh, when I see a sudden acceleration upwards like that in Sigma L or a sudden acceleration downwards, I um, I account that uh, for the longer cycles. In other words, the longer cycles that we don't know anything about, probably the 18-year cycle, um, which suddenly hit its stride. What happens with these cycles is is we visualize them as as sine waves because you know that's the most useful way of visualizing them um, and we uh, uh, know that they they sort of move very smoothly and uh, they have synchronized troughs so we tend to get troughs that occur at the same time um, but we imagine that they that they move fairly smoothly and at a constant speed if you like uh, my experience in the markets is that cycles don't really have a constant speed and that what will happen is that one cycle will suddenly uh, you know come into its own and it will suddenly accelerate and so I believe that's what we saw happening uh, during this period of time over here from two, late 2011 until 2015 and in my opinion it was probably the 18 year cycle um, it might even have been the 36 year cycle but I've got absolutely no um, evidence to base that on so I uh, you know I suspect that the 18 year cycle suddenly kind of found its second wind or its first wind and uh, you know sort of steamed upwards so that's what um, that's what I believe um, is 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 happening happening over there. How do you deal with the fact that you have an unknown, you have Sigma L which is an un unknown, uh, you know, what do you do about that? Well, what I do, I've already shown you the composite model line and there it is. So uh, what I do is, is I will take a look at the composite model line and uh, let's just zoom in and then I turn off, okay, so this is what we're expecting, but then I turn off Sigma L Okay, and I look at that composite model line. Now, that is really, really interesting. And let's just zoom out a little bit. Let's go all the way out. And so let's uh, zoom in on what's happened since 2016. Okay, so according to this analysis and this cyclic model, uh, you can see there was a big discrepancy that happened. Uh, here the composite model line is moving up to a peak over there and price is also moving up. Okay, Here composite model line is moving down, here price is moving down but not very much. Then price moved up, CML moved up. But then from this moment over here which is the beginning of 2017 price has moved steadily upwards and what's happened to the composite model line it moves steadily downwards into this 18 month uh, cycle trough over there so that is a is a big discrepancy and let's see if i can change the color so that area of time is a really big discrepancy where price has experienced more bullishness than we have in our composite model line. Now what do we have in our composite model line? In our composite model line we've got all the information about the cyclic analysis that's present on this chart from five days up to nine years. So uh, in this period of time from the beginning of 2017 we've had a, a big discrepancy. What is that big discrepancy? In my opinion that big discrepancy is that the 18 year cycle has suddenly started kicking in and that's why uh, you know that's why we've had that that strong move. Why? Because this chart doesn't have any information about that 18-year cycle at all. Okay, there is absolutely no information.
So, um, unfortunately, we have uh, run to time, and I promised we'd take a look at several other markets, but there isn't going to be time for us to look at other markets. But uh, what I would like to very quickly do is just spend five minutes, if you can... Uh, if you can spare another five minutes, taking a look at another very interesting look at the same market, the S&P 500. It's something I've done before. It's something I've discussed on uh, these webinars. It's something I do every day in my trading. Um, well, not, not every day. I do it every week because it's fairly labor intensive. Um, but that is that I look at a market um, on the basis of a different um valuation. Let me try and explain that. We've been looking at the S&P 500 uh, uh, based effectively in US dollars. Okay, uh, let me just go back to the S&P 500. Um, so this is the S&P 500, the stock market index, valued in US dollars. You might argue that it's just a number because it's an index and it's not based in dollars, but because this is an American market, it is effectively based in US dollars. Okay, and Sometimes I like to take a look at the S&P 500 valued in gold or valued in anything else. I also look at the S&P 500 valued in oil. So um, this chart here is the S&P 500 valued in gold. So in other words, when price moves up the axis over here, that tells us that we need more answers uh, that the S&P 500 is worth more ounces of gold. And in fact, I, I don't know if you can see this number, that's the number five. So at this level over here, gold, uh, the S&P 500 is worth five ounces of gold. At the present moment in time, the S&P 500 index is worth 1.88 ounces of gold. Okay, so um, while you're trying to get your, your head around that idea, um, let me uh, quickly take a look at the analysis that's been performed here. So this is the S&P 500 valued in gold. And what I've done is I've performed a completely standard analysis, default nominal model. I haven't adjusted my nominal model. I haven't done anything. I haven't built um, expert models. I've done nothing. I've performed a default analysis. And do you see how, how beautiful this analysis is? I don't know if you share my opinion about beautiful analyses, but there are some very beautiful aspects to this analysis. First of all, we have a peak here in late uh, 1999. Then we have another peak here, which is uh, you know, which is a, a very insignificant peak. But that's because clearly the nine-year cycle um, was being overpowered by uh, the 18-year cycle. And here we have the next nine-year cycle peak. So, if we come back to the question of, has that nine-year cycle peak formed in the S&P 500? Here we have yet further evidence that that nine-year cycle peak uh, almost certainly has formed, because even when valued relative to gold, it, uh, it dropped sharply. And uh, here we have a trough uh, in 2003, and we have another trough in 2011 of the nine-year cycles. We have the 54-month cycle trough over here. And, uh, and so let's just quickly spend a moment uh, speaking about what the differences are between this analysis and uh, the analysis we were looking at a moment ago, apart from the fact that it's a, a different valuation of the instrument. So um, if we turn again to our zigzags, and um, as a matter of interest, this chart looks very broken up. That's because you've got two things changing value. You've got the S&P 500 changing value and also gold. So that's why the, the chart looks a bit ragged and it looks a bit sort of um, spread out like that. Um, so let's quickly have a look at our zigzags and let's have a look at our nine year zigzags. Uh, and here we go. Let's turn those off. Here's the nine-year uh, zigzag. Okay. So from a nine-year peak, we would expect price to move down to the most impressive trough that it can find on the way. Okay. Then it should move up to the most impressive peak that it can find on the way to the next nine-year trough, which is a peak over here. And then it'll move down into the nine-year cycle trough, which according to this analysis is expected over here. So 
this uh, uh, this analysis is is also uh, probably giving us a bearish outlook on our s p 500 even relative to gold um, but uh, it's not nearly as bullish as the other analysis and uh, uh, I hope that you that you understand why that is if we zoom in onto this chart and and take a look at a slightly uh, more detailed picture um, let's in fact take a look at what that 18 month cycle is expected to do and the 54 month cycle there you can see the bullishness um, as uh, both of those projections are expecting and let's just uh, zoom back a little bit both of those cycle projections are expecting the S&P 500 to uh, gain in value relative to gold uh, there's something I'd like to point out about this analysis and that is the the sheer beauty of the trough analysis if you like look at these very neat nests of lows for the 18 month cycle trough for the 40 week cycle and the next 18 month cycle over here you've got very very neat nests of lows what does that mean it means that the cycles in this particular instrument which is the S&P 500 valued in terms of gold the cycles have been very regular recently and um, the analysis has been really um, uh, uh, very constant and when I see that happening at the foot of my chart um, I sit up and pay attention I think it's it's very likely that the S&P 500 has bounced uh, out of an 18 month cycle trough uh, recently and I think we're looking at some bullishness both in terms of its relationship to its value in gold and also uh, its uh, its value in terms of the United States dollar and um, the uh, where is that chart over here um, uh, you know the the standard um, S&P 500 uh, index and with that, I'm going to have to uh, call an end to today's webinar. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you for your interest in Hearst Cycles. I hope you found this interesting. Uh, and um, if you have any questions, please do email them. Uh, we'll do our best to answer them uh, in the interim before our next webinar. Uh, the next webinar is going to be happening uh, in the third week of October. I've changed the rhythm of these webinars and we will be sending out an email that actually explains the process moving forward. I'm going to be doing these webinars uh, once a month but we are going to be starting some other events which will be filling in the gaps in between to give you your dose of Hearst Cycles. So please look out for that webinar. We will be uh, sending it over the next few weeks. We have a whole new Hearst Cycles Trading Academy. It's one of the things I've been very busy with. Uh, so all of our our current courses are going to be moving into the new academy and we're going to be starting a whole lot of new courses so that's uh, very exciting something to look forward to thank you very much for your time thank you for interest in Hearst Cycles I wish you profitable trading go out there and uh, trade successfully and profitably and I look forward to seeing you on our next webinar <laughs>